Good morning, and thank you, as always, for joining me as we begin a new week in, in the Word of God. Our, our reading today, it's a lengthy reading, and I, I want us to read through uh, Stephen's sermon, his defense, his appeal, his history lesson, however you want to refer to it. But at the end of the day, this man of God, Stephen, I want us to get this morning that he was telling this audience the truth. We're going to be in Acts chapter 6 to begin with, and we're going to read uh, through Acts chapter 7. And, and I want us to take Stephen's appeal. I want us to take it in. And as we read it, I want us to think about how do I respond to the truth? You know, the reality is sometimes the truth is hard to hear. We've all been there. Sometimes the truth requires us to make a change. And I am convinced from my own personal experience that oftentimes change is the hardest thing for any of us to do, even when it's a good change, even when we recognize that it's a good change, change is really, really hard. But, but here's the thing, and I, I think this is so important. Regardless of how we respond to the truth, regardless of how hard the response is to truth, no matter what, the thing about truth, it remains the truth. Absolute truth, which is what God's word is, doesn't change. Circumstances or even one's perception does not change the truth. So the question for every single one of us, what are we going to do with the truth? I want to read this together. It's lengthy, but I hope you'll hang with me. We're going to start in Acts chapter 6. We're going to begin at verse 8, and we're going to read all the way down to the end of chapter 7. Let's begin at verse 8. It says, The Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogues of the freedmen, including uh, both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were not able to cope with the wisdom of the Spirit which he was, with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard uh, him speak blasphemous words against Moses, against God. And they start up the people, the elders and scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks about this holy place in the law. For, for we've heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And, and fixing their gaze on them, all, were, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Acts chapter 7, verse 1, the high priest said, are, are, are these things so? And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Aaron. And he said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. And he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, his, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are living now. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land. They would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And, and after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the, the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Uh, yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and, and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction with it, and our fathers could find no good. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family, the same family, was disclosed to Pharaoh. Verse 14 says, Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and his fathers died. From there they, removed, they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for some money from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. But as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt, until there arose another king of Egypt who, nothing about John, who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so they, could, so they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, he had entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance from the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler and 
judge over us. You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, verse 31, he marveled at the sign, and as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear, but not ventured to look. But the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt have heard their groans, and I come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, who made you a ruler and judge? Is this the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and deliverer with the help of the angel that appeared to him in Thornbush? This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who ascended to the sons of Israel. God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with angels who were speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with your fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses, who, who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. And at that time, they made a calf and, and brought a sacrifice to the idol, and rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven, as it's written in the book of the prophets. It was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the God, wrong for the images which were made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it on, uh, in, in their turn, our fathers uh, brought it with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? You men, verse 51, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. And you who received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you didn't keep it. And when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, verse 54, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. The witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of the young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. That's quite a reading. I know it's a little lengthy, but I, I hope you recognize how good it is for us to be reminded uh, of these things. Verse 10 says that they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit by which he was speaking. You know, not a whole lot has changed, has it? They couldn't cope with the truth. So instead of engaging and reflecting and even charging, instead of dealing with the truth, they attack the person. They conjure up some ridiculous and baseless charges, and they drag Stephen, this man of God, before the council. In chapter 7, in his defense, Stephen takes these men through a history of God's people and ultimately accuses them of rejecting and resisting the will of God. Verse 51, resisting the Holy Spirit, he says, as they had always done. You see, their history was one of rejecting God's chosen vessels to reveal his will and persecuting the prophets, messengers for God, uh, to the point of killing the Son of God, the one whom had been prophesied about throughout the law that they claimed to cherish but were disobedient to, as Stephen says. And here's the thing. All of this was true. What you see in their reaction is no factual rebuttal, no theological rebuttal. There isn't one, because it's truth. They've been presented with the truth. You remember the reaction in Acts chapter 2 when those 
people were presented with the truth. And Acts chapter 2, verse 37, you remember when they said, now when they heard this, when they heard the truth, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what are we to do? You see, that's what happens when truth confronts the honest and good heart. Now you contrast that with these arrogant, puffed up, delusional leaders in verse 54. Now, when they heard this, this is Acts 7 at verse 54, they were infuriated, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Look at, look at verse 55. It says, but he being full of the Holy Spirit, that being Stephen, looked intently into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing right at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They can still do the right thing. Now will they listen? Will they accept the truth? Will they change? No. What will they do with the truth? Look at verse 57. But they shouted with loud voices, covered their ears, and rushed at him with one mind. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. Here's the reality, brethren. Stephen told them the truth. And instead of being pierced to the heart, instead of humbling themselves, instead of repenting of their sins and being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, Instead of accepting Jesus on his terms, listening to the messengers of God led by the Holy Spirit, they were mad and they gnashed their teeth and they shouted and they covered their ears like children. And then they killed the messenger. The exact thing that Stephen had confronted them with by way of their history, by way of their present. They wouldn't accept the truth. Jesus said, in, Acts, in John chapter 8, verse 31, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's true. The truth will set you free. That's absolute truth. But how about this? If your heart's not right, if you're not honest with yourselves, if you're not honest with truth, the truth, it'll make you really mad. It may even cause you to cover your ears and scream. But it's still the truth. So let me pose this question as, as we close. Why not just accept the truth as it is? And change if that's what truth is calling for. Quit fighting the truth. You know, regardless of what they did to Stephen, regardless of their unwillingness to accept the truth, it didn't change the truth. The truth was still the truth. So here's my question for us. What's your reaction when confronted to truth? Acts 2.37 or Acts 7.54. Let's pray again. Our Father in heaven, Father, we are so thankful for the truth that has been revealed to us. Father, give us and help us to be humble, to recognize that your word is truth and it's good for us. Father, help us to always rightly divide your truth and to accept it in humility. Give us the courage to repent in light of truth if needed. Father, we pray for every soul that is listening to this this morning. And if things are not right, Father, I pray that you would give them the courage this very morning to repent and to change in light of truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.